I'm excited to continue our series on Lent today. Uh, today's going to be a little bit different, um, but uh, you, I'm not going to spoil it for you. So uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm, I'm going to begin. Dear God, we know that um, with all the things that goes on in our lives, it's, it's sometimes hard not to just simply pause for a moment and ask you to come in close, to, to prepare our hearts and our minds for the songs that we sing, for the message being heard, God, for your word being read, uh, for a communion, for, for all the things that we gather on a Sunday morning for, God, that we pause for a moment and focus our attention and our hearts and our minds and our entire souls upon you. And so God, I pray as we talk about deep things, as we focus in on your word and when we think about the God that you are, God, that you would come in close. That you would be a God that is near, that you would hear us, that we could speak to you, and that the world would know the significance of your message because of how you've impacted and transformed us. In your name we pray, amen. So if you have your notes, um, you can follow along kind of with the fill in the blanks there. Uh, if not, don't worry about it. We're going to kind of just work through some stories in the Bible uh, real quick, and so, or not real quick, over, over the next few minutes here. So... Um, you know, one of, the, one of the earliest stories in the Bible uh, is the story of Abraham. Abraham was uh, called to be the father of uh, the nation of Israel, that he was the one who um, brought in the family as eventually of Jesus to, re to help the whole world. And uh, early on, what Abraham does is God promises him a son, and Abraham and his wife decide to kind of go around God's plan and bring in a son of their own. And so what Abraham and his wife do is they take his maid as a, as a wife and she conceives and has a son named Ishmael. Now that wasn't God's plan, that God was gonna provide for them if they waited, but they didn't. And so what ended up happening was later on, God promises them their uh, son, Isaac. And when Isaac is born, there is a fight between uh, Isaac's mother, Sarah, and Hagar, which is Ishmael's mother. And so Sarah sends them away and they are running out into the wilderness. And uh, in Genesis 21, what ends up happening is Sarah, uh, sorry, Hagar and Ishmael are, um, are in the desert. And Hagar sends and puts Ishmael underneath a bush because she can't stand to watch her son die. They have no water left, they have no food, and she's preparing for his death and she can't hold him as he dies, so she goes and she walks away. And in Genesis 21, 17, it says this, and God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Early on in this story, God hears the cries of his children. Later on through the family of Abraham, right, we, we end up making it to Egypt. And God saves the family through uh, a famine in the land by putting them in Egypt where they multiply and, and the population grows to a point where the Egyptians begin to oppress them and eventually enslave them. And so they begin to cry out to God. So you get to the early part of Exodus chapter 2. 2.23, it says, during those day, many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew that they cried out to God because of the oppression and slavery that they were experiencing, and God heard their cries, and he knew, he knew their pain, he knew their suffering, he knew their affliction. Later on, God, through these 10 plagues and through uh, showing his immense power over the Egyptian gods, delivers them out of Egypt, and as they're running away, they get stuck at the Red Sea and they cry out to God, and God parts the sea for them, and they cross on dry ground. Then they get to the other side and they get in the wilderness and they say, God, um, we're hungry, we have no food. And God rains bread from heaven. And quail come around and they are fed, water from rocks. I mean, so many ways that they cried out to God for help and he delivered them. 
Later on, they um, get to Mount Sinai, and God is speaking the laws to them. And it, one of the laws was actually that he would hear the cries of those that they oppressed. That, that God would listen to the cries of the people that would be oppressed by the nation of Israel. And so he wanted to make sure that even those who were being oppressed by his people, his voices were heard. Then they make it to the promised land. They, they get into the promised land and they all but rid the people of the promised land, right? But not all of them. And so what do they do is they fall into sin and idolatry of these foreign gods. And as they do that, God allows the foreign kings to come in and take them over. And so they cry out to God in the book of Judges. They cry out to God and God hears them. All right, you go to the book of Judges, chapter 3. three nine says this, But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. You'll see that over and over and over again in the story of Judges where uh, God would deliver the people and they would be faithful to God, but then they would fall into to sin and idolatry and they would become slaves to a foreign king and then God would, they would cry out to God and then God would deliver them with another judge, another redeemer. So we have Othniel and Deborah and Ehud and Gideon and the line goes on and on of all of these people that would come in because they would cry out to God and God would deliver them. And then you go to 1 Samuel. In the beginning of 1 Samuel, we read about a woman. A woman that has failed repeatedly to have a child. And she's broken, and she's hurting, and she cries out to God because she wants a son. In 1 Samuel 1, 9 through 10, it says... Um, uh, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow that said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall touch his head. She prayed to God for a son, and she said, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. And she did. And the prophet Samuel became one of the most significant prophets for the nation of Israel in his life. And Hannah cried out to God, and he hurt her. Samuel cried out many times on behalf of the people of Israel because of their idolatry. And eventually, whenever the people of Israel decided uh, judges and, and uh, prophets were not enough, we need a king, God responded. God gave them Saul. Because the people cried out and God heard. After Saul comes David, and we have an entire uh, catalog of David's cry out to God's in the book of Psalms. David was not a cry out to God because everything was good. David was a cry out to God because his life kind of rivals afternoon soap operas. I mean, David often fell into these terrible situations and cried out to God because of his sin. Right, after waiting for 15 years to become king, right, after watching a friend of his die because he didn't follow the rules of moving the Ark of the Covenant correctly, and then with his sin with Bathsheba and the death and murder of his commander and the consequence of his sin and the death of his son, he cries out to God and God hears you see, David cried out to God, and God listened. Then years later, when his son makes a military coup and takes over the kingdom and kicks his own father out of the kingdom, David cries out to God, and God listens. And then what about Jonah? Jonah. Now, I remember growing up as a kid, we had a Heroes of the Faith VBS where Jonah was one of the guys, and we built this cool little, like, inside the whale, and it even smelled like, you know, 
canned tuna. Um, and I remember going through that story, uh, remembering what Jonah did. And then as I became an adult, I read the story and I realized that Jonah's really the only villain in the entire story. You see, God asked Jonah to go share a message, right? Maybe not a great message, but a message with the people of Nineveh, telling them that their sin was loud and that they needed to turn from their sin. But Jonah said, I don't like those people. They don't look like me. They don't talk like me. In fact, Jonah was pretty racist in his response to the people of Nineveh. And so what does he do? He runs away. He runs away, and as he's running away, God is still calling out to him, right, in the form of a storm. So what does Jonah do? Well, he really just tries to commit suicide. He jumps off in the middle of the ocean. But what does God do? God says, I'm not done with you yet, and so he sends a big fish, and the fish eats him up, and in, from the belly of the fish, this is what Jonah says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. He cried out, to God, and he answered. All right, you fast forward to the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, there's a kind of heartbreaking story of a man named Bartimaeus. And Jesus is going along. Actually, I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and read this, this whole section to you. It says, and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with the disciples, a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Did you hear that? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. Jesus heard the cries of this man, he stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do, you want, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him along the way cried out to God, and he answered. Those were a handful of stories that I pulled from the Bible, but there are countless stories of people calling out to God. And every time they call out, God answers. He hears your cry. And maybe you are like Hagar and Ishmael who find yourself in a bad situation, not of your own choosing. God can hear your cry. Maybe you're like the nation of Israel and you find yourself in some type of slavery. Maybe it's addiction, right? Maybe it's some type of relationship, whatever it may be. When you cry out to God, he hears you and he will respond. Maybe you're in a stage of life right now where things just don't seem to be getting better. Maybe you're like Hannah and you've struggled for God to provide for you the thing you desire the most. God hears your cry. Maybe you're like David and you have sinned and you are feeling the consequences of those sin and you're crying out to God and he hears your cry and maybe you are like Jonah and you're running from God's plan and you're crying out to God and he hears your cry or maybe you are hurting like Bartimaeus, and you're crying out to God, and he wants to provide healing for you. God hears your cry because he is a God who is close, close enough to hear a scream and close enough to hear a whisper. So we're going we're gonna to sing a couple songs right now. We're going to give you a little bit of time and space Maybe to cry out to God. Maybe you need to just sit and listen. But as we sing these songs, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to be prepared for God to answer. Be prepared for him to be close. Would you pray with me? God, our desire...
It's not that you would just give us all the things that we want, God, but you would give us what you see that we need. We need more than just the healing of our physical bodies, God. We need a response to the sin and the brokenness that exists in our lives and in the lives of those around us. But God, we know through your word that when we cry out, not only do you hear us, but you respond. So God, I pray for that response right now. In your name we pray, amen. If you would, if you would just stay standing for one minute here. Um, I'm gonna read uh, Psalm 121, and we're gonna, we're gonna spend a little bit more time uh, in there for, uh, so would you read with me? I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time and forevermore. Amen. You can have a seat. You know, when my uh, sons were little, um, and probably more often than I'd like to admit now, they would ask us to lay in their room with them or stay in their room with them until they fell asleep. They, they would uh, ask us, just, just be in the room, right? It's kind of the idea. And I even got to watch my nephew a few weeks ago or a couple, last week sometime. And he, same, same thing. I had forgotten a little bit about that, that he wants you to stay in the room until he falls asleep. And, and as I remembered thinking of that, I, I, I don't know if it was there was a scary monster in the closet or under their bed. or um, I don't know if they believed I had some type of mystical power over like four-headed trolls or whatever it was that was hiding there. Um, I assure you, I do not. But in their mind, their father was there to keep them safe. A parent was there to make sure as they fell asleep, there was someone watching over them. Right, don't tell my sons, I've never been in a fight before, so I don't really know what I would even do in that moment. And so over the past, you know, 15, 17 days of Lent, we have been looking inward, right? We've been looking inward to the sin in our hearts, in our lives. We've been looking at the sin in our world and the brokenness that exists among us. We look back at stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament where brokenness was so pervasive that people had to cry out to God for relief and for rescue. Then last week we looked at the other side, right? We looked at the way things were supposed to be without sin and the way things will be and how we're kind of just stuck in the middle. That things are going to be a certain way and things used to be a certain way, but right now, how do we live? And so what do we do? Well, sometimes we cry out to God. Other times, maybe we self-medicate. But either way, the, the crying out to God is something that we do because it's something that our heart desires. And that's why Psalm 121 starts with, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Right, there's, there's no Selah in the margin here. I wish there was. Uh, but there's no pause moment for us. But if we would, for a moment, pause and think about what the writer is saying there. Now, it could be a military term where uh, Savior or the, the, the oncoming reinforcements were coming through from the hills. But I think what was more likely was in their day, up in the hills were where people went to find God. And by God, I don't mean big G Yahweh God, I mean little g idols, gods. And so the psalmist, right, David, uh, David says, or it doesn't say David, sorry, the psalmist says that he looks to the hills, is there help that comes from the hills? And the answer is no. But there is no relief from these false idols, they cannot bring you what you need. And then he says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. But we often find ourselves here where when we need help and we cry out to God, instead of looking to him for the answer, whether it's not because he's speaking or we're listening, but because we choose to not be patient enough, we find ourselves looking to other idols. The idols of ambition, 
the idols of addiction and materialism, maybe significance from relationships around you, right? Cheap intimacy or even just apathy. We look for these things to cry, to fill what we cry out to God for. It says, my help comes from the Lord. Those hills that you're crying out to, why don't we call out the one that even makes the hills? Let's cry out to the God who makes the hills. And then he says, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. That he is a God who oversees you while you rest. So no danger can come to you. Just as I watch over my sons as they sleep, God will watch over you. That you can cry out to him and he will answer. He will comfort. He will provide relief. He will pro- provide salvation and redemption. Whether you're a Jonah and you're running, whether you're David and you're crying, God can come close. But there's another moment in the Bible where someone cries out to God. There's there's another moment where someone loudly cries out to God, but not on his own behalf, but on ours. You see, in Matthew 27, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn there. In Matthew 27, and by the way, we have little Bibles around here. I know the print is tiny and it's hard to read in here. I get that. If you need a Bible, that is yours. Just, just take it. Um, and if, yeah, just, just grab one. But uh, if you want to use those, you're welcome to. If not, Matthew 27. Jesus <clears throat> has been uh, accused He's been put before all of the religious leaders. He's been put before Pilate. He's now been uh, beaten and mocked and imprisoned, placed upon a cross between two thieves. And in verse 45, it says, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Right, from, from 12 in the afternoon until three, the hottest parts of the day where the sun shows the brightest, there is darkness. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them ran at once and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now I'm sure there's many well-meaning preachers who connect the sin that was placed upon Jesus and God's desire to not be near sin uh, to, to come up with this idea that God has turned his back on Jesus. And I don't think that is at all what is happening here. See, what Jesus is doing is is he's crying out on behalf of the brokenness that exists in our world and in our hearts. And he's pointing us back to a beautiful passage in Psalm 22. And if you go back to Psalm 22 and you read that passage, it's it's the story, it's, it's the poem of someone being far from God and God hearing the cry and drawing them in close. And in Psalm 22, 24, it says, For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. See, I believe as Jesus is on the cross, he's pointing it back to the God of the universe who has not forgotten the people he created, but providing the atonement, the sacrifice, the redemption, the payment for the sin that becomes so part of our lives that we look to hills rather than the creator for redemption. And in this moment, Jesus cries out to God so that you and I have the ability to know him, to know God. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message translation of the Bible, says it this way. He has never let you down, never looked the other way when you were being kicked around. He's never wandered off to do his own thing. He has been right there listening. You know, over the past few weeks, we've talked about sin and brokenness and death. We've talked about the pain and affliction that we face each and every day of our lives. We ask the question, Where is the relief? Where does my help come from? 
And we look to a future in heaven and a, and a past that was perfect, and we ask ourselves, how do we get back or how do we get to this place? And the answer is right here. That Jesus Christ heard your cry and he responded. The promise of the entire Bible is that God hears the cries of his people and he responds. And I keep finding myself going back this week to Isaiah 53 verse 5 and repeating it over and over in my head that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his wounds we are healed. We cry out to God because brokenness from sin exists in our hearts and God responded by putting his son on a cross. And as you and I stand here and worship a risen savior, we approach the table of communion. As we approach the communion table and we think about and dwell upon and reflect on the work that Jesus did on the cross, it reminds us that he has paid the price that he has finished the work, that when he's on the cross, he says, it is finished. And when you and I, when we believe in Jesus, he asks us to take the bread and we eat it as a remembrance of his body broken for us. And as we drink the juice, we remember that his body was pierced for our transgressions. And not only do we take it to remember what Jesus has done, we take it to think forward to the day when all of that will be gone and we will get to celebrate with him for eternity. And so right now we're gonna take communion together and I just wanna give you a moment to think about who Jesus is for you. That he hears your cry. He listens to you. He knows you. And he responded with the cross. Would you pray with me? God, when I read Matthew 27, when I read Psalm 22, when I read Isaiah 53, God, the, the magnitude of your ability to hear our cries is overwhelming. But I, I am often overwhelmed by the magnitude of your love and your mercy and your grace and that you were not subjecting us to your judgment, but you placed it upon Jesus. And so as we take communion together, God, help us to remember, help us to focus, help us to be overflowed and overwhelmed with the depths you went to to hear, listen, and respond to our cries. God, I pray that we would be a people who would share this message with the world, that there is a God who sees you, who hears you, who loves you, and will respond to you. And it doesn't require anything but to look upon the cross. We just pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.